Welcome to It's Your Dime, a straight talk interview series presented by Shift Gold. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. In this episode, I'll be talking with author and libertarian activist Mary Ruert about death by regulation. Mary is the author of several books, including Healing Our World and Death by Regulation. In this interview, we talk about her work to help people in third world countries get free and clear title to their land. We also talk about how FDA regulations limit our choices and literally kill people, how state actions have undermined federal power, how regulations in general stymie the economy, how government spending retards economic growth, and the impact of tariffs. Well, we are here today with Mary Ruert. Did I say your name right? That's right, right? That's right. Yes, okay. Ruart. Huh? Soft W. <laughs> Ruart. Okay. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. And uh, what I would like to do first is what I do with all of my guests. I like to call this, who are you and why are you on my show? So <laughs> okay. This is your opportunity just to give us a little bit of, of your background. You've, you've had your fingers in so many different things. Uh, so you can just kind of touch on the, on the basics of, of who you are and what you've been up to. Okay, well, I'm a research scientist by profession. Um, I consult these days for nutraceutical companies and pharmaceutical companies generally. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a libertarian author, best known probably for my book, Healing Our World. Mm -hmm. I know that one. Actually, the one that that I uh, first came to know you through was the uh, death by regulation. That's the first thing that I heard about. Uh, That's recent. Uh Uh-huh. That's my my most recent book. And you were a, uh, a VP presidential candidate on the uh, LP ticket at one time. Is that correct? Um, actually, I was a contender for the presidential okay, nomination, gotcha. and I did not get it. <laughs> I lost by about 46 votes or something. Well, so, given, given, given what the LP's given us, maybe that's not such a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, won't, we won't go into any LP bashing tonight or uh, today, but... Uh, I'd like to start a little bit. Uh, you're on the uh, the board of Liberty International, which is a fantastic organization, and right. I want to start off talking a little bit about that. So why don't you first just kind of give an overview of uh, what the organization is doing? I know it's been around for quite a long time. That's right. About 35 years, we were the International Society for Individual Liberty uh, until the last few years. That's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, our acronym was ISIL. <laughs> and our Ooh. website was ISIL.org. So yeah, we got good. hacked uh, so many times we finally changed the name. So Liberty International kind of thinks of itself as the Johnny Appleseed organization of the international liberty movement. What we do is we go into a variety of countries and, and do different things. Uh, we translate um, books, for example. We were the first organization to translate Ayn Rand's books into her native Russian. Oh, wow. and um, Ken Schoolin's book, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, which is sort of an illustrated libertarian free market fable, uh, has been translated into, I think it's now 45 languages. And it's, it's also been made into plays and other types of musicals. So it's a very great, uh, great thing. And Liberty International has been helping with that. My book, Healing Our World, has been translated into, I think it's eight different Eastern European languages that happened right after the Berlin Wall came down because, of course, you know, uh, freedom type literature was very scarce, especially in in their native languages. So we did a lot of that. Um, Right now, we're trying to focus on educating new libertarians into the principles because that's something traditionally that Liberty International has done. When I was learning the principles, one of my main um, educational tools was the 30 plus trifold pamphlets that uh, the International Society for Individual Liberty had. And each one was like an issue paper. So we would sit down and discuss each of these issues in different different times. And so we're resurrecting that and trying to make them into – a short videos because of course that's oh, cool. the medium for today. Yep, sure is. Mm-hmm. Yep, people love their videos. You know, mm-hmm. it's funny because I don't have the patience for them. Like I'd rather read. <laughs> I, I'm I'm a fast reader. Here. 
And uh, yeah, so so to sit down and watch a 15 minute video that will I can read whatever it is in 10 minutes drives me crazy. So I always put the videos on like super fast speed. So yes. It's yes, I, I do the same. I do the same. And one other thing that Liberty International does, we have annual conferences, which are more like a family get together. We mm-hmm. just had the last one in Mongolia. Next year, it's going to be Colombia. Oh, I think cool. it's going to be August. We haven't uh, we haven't finalized the date yet. So if any of your uh, listeners want to know more, they can go to liberty-intl.org. Or they can even type type in the old acronym ISIL.org and get to our website. <laughs> okay, cool. We'll put the uh, links on the show notes page for this, so people can just go right there and click. Right. Um, right. So, private property, one of the foundational uh, principles of liberty, and mm-hmm. obviously, also I think uh, one of the building blocks of of a. Uh, a free and prosperous economic system. I don't think you can have a good economic system without private property. And one of the things that you mentioned to me before we were um, actually doing the show was that there's a huge problem in third world countries of getting free and clear title. Yes. And you guys over at Liberty International are doing something about that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yes. What happens in third world countries is people squat on the land And their homesteading, even if it's been through generations, is not normally recognized by the government. So they can't mortgage that land to start a business. They can't really sell it in the way we normally think of it. They do, you know, they do, title does change, title, and I'm I'm using that (laughs) very um, informally, (laughs) changes hands. But of course, because the government can kick them off the land at any time because it actually has title. Uh, right. You know, they can't, they don't dare build on it anything fancy. Um, so when they do get free and clear title by a very convoluted process, uh, overnight the property values double. And now these people who are very poor actually are really propelled into the middle class. So we're trying to help them do that at Liberty International. One of our um, Indian reps, uh, Batram Mitra, is, is, spearheading an effort and Liberty International is helping by raising funds to get GPS units for farming communities. And what they do is they settle all their disputes. They use the GPS to map all of their properties that they agree on. And then it's very much easier to take it to the government and get approval for the whole community. So we're trying to help with that. And really, if you can think of any foreign aid program on all that would help these poor people it's that Mm -hmm. that is and it's it's really not that expensive when you come right down to it so we're really excited about it yeah that's really cool because you're talking about generational wealth at that point you know as as opposed to sending some money or some food which might help in the short term uh, Mm -hmm. when when you have land title then i mean that's something you can pass down and and can stay in families and and like you said you can leverage that for uh, so many other things. That's that's an incredible program. Yes, yes, and 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 you know we're we take donations specifically for that. So if any of your listeners really are excited about that, they can just check out the website and donate specifically to that project. All right, we'll put that link on the show notes page as well, so we can right. we'll get people to do that because that's that's uh, you know so many times I, I think as as libertarians we wonder well what can we do besides post on Facebook and read another book and. Uh, you guys are doing some really cool practical things, and it's it's neat to me because I think as Americans we get a little bit myopic about uh, about liberty and think that it's kind of our domain, and uh, <laughs> it's it's neat to see uh, this movement that is really international and, and in all these different countries. That's right. And we are seeing that, you know, because we are an international organization, we're in contact with a lot of uh, the young people who have been activated initially by Ron Paul Mm -hmm. and have gotten very excited about liberty. It's happening all over the world. It is so neat to see because for so many years, I actually kind of wondered if there was going to be anybody to pass the baton to when the time came. But now I don't worry about that at all. Yeah, it is neat. I I see that on my Facebook page. with with people that are friend requesting me that are involved in the liberty movement and there's so many people in their 20s you know yes. young folks and they're so enthusiastic and not quite as jaded and cynical as I am so that's kind of nice too um i want to pivot just for a minute uh to talk a little bit about regulation because like i said sure. uh, your book on 
on on death by regulation was was your first exposure or my first exposure to your work mm-hmm. and it dovetails with what I do at the 10th Amendment Center uh some of the things that we're working on at the state level uh, are initiatives to try to kind of undermine what the what the FDA is doing because we found that when states uh, allow things, it becomes more difficult for the feds to control them. So that's right. That's that's a beautiful thing. And one of the things I wanted to specifically ask you about, just because it's top of mind and it's something that's personal to me, have you been following the uh, FDA uh, regulation of uh, CBD? Oh, uh, you, you mean it's, it's well, what I've been following, it sounds like they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> which is not unusual. I mean, all these years they've been uh, basically, uh, they kind of say, well, nothing's proven. That's the way they they kind of discourage people. You know, it's not been proven. It's not been shown to be effective. Uh, and, of course, a lot of things have actually been shown to be effective, just mm-hmm. not in the way that the FDA wants to see, which are double-blind, very large clinical trials, which are very, very costly. And they don't seem to accept anecdotal work or case histories or anything like that, right. which, you know, is in many cases, they're very valid. So, Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at this point, they just had a hearing and and uh, so it, it looks very much like, and, and people don't realize this, at this point, the FDA actually maintains complete control over CBD, and technically, it's illegal to sell or to put it into food, because it is a, it is a drug that's undergoing clinical trials, and it's been uh, uh, actually put into a prescription medication for epilepsy. Mm-hmm. So according to the FDA... It's illegal, and yet it's everywhere right now. So they're they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Do you have any sense of of what they might do? I mean, is there any chance at all they might like hands off, or do you think they'll they'll crack down? It's hard to know exactly what the FDA is going to do with CBD, but because the states are legalizing cannabis, it's going to be very hard for them to enforce regulations around it. On the other hand, they're going to be wanting to do that because we have a CBD product on the market from a pharmaceutical firm, and the FDA likes to protect the pharmaceutical firms because the Prescription Drug User Fee Act ended up having the drug companies paying about 70% or so of the salaries of the FDA examiners. <laughs> so, oh, so there's just a little conflict of interest going on. Little, yeah. I mean, in any other company, this would be huge. I, I, I don't know why no one talks about it. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because so often you'll get, especially from the left, you know, you'll get this. Well, the you know the the government's going to protect us, and they they seem just oblivious to the fact that that so often these big companies have bought and paid for the regulations that uh, everybody thinks are so great. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the regulatory capture happens when you have lots of regulation because the industry that's being regulated needs to defend itself, and that's how they do it. So it shouldn't be surprising to anybody. Do you think all of these regulations really – I mean, here's the argument you're going to get back. Mm -hmm. Mary, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but, you know, these are to protect us and to to keep us safe. Yeah, well, you know, in 1962 – the FDA really got its teeth with the regulations that were passed then. Mm -hmm. And before they were passed, the rate at which drugs were withdrawn from the market after FDA approval was about 2.5%. Today, it's about 3.3%. So it's gone up. It hasn't (laughs) gone down. (laughs) So it's actually gotten worse with the tighter control. Yeah, I mean, that difference is significant, which it might not be, but it's gone in the wrong direction. And and there's some good reasons for that, um, but... You know, because it's changed the way the drug companies choose what they're going to develop. Now, on the flip side of that, it's been very damaging because it it used to be that it took four years to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. The 62 amendments created an increase, basically an open-ended increase in FDA regulations. So it, it takes about 14 years now. That's insane. Yeah. And so, you know, the AIDS patients, when we were working on drugs uh, for the AIDS patients, they didn't wait for 14 years of regulatory red tape. They hired black market chemists to make the very drugs we were working on in the industry. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to test them in people, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted our drugs had them. 
and they were resistant. So we had to wait for new patients to be diagnosed. Now, the cancer patients didn't want to do that, so they sued the FDA, claiming that they had the right to life guaranteed by the Constitution and that they should be able to use anything they wanted to save their life if they were terminal. The court said, no, Americans do not have the right to save their lives with unapproved drugs. And so that was the beginning of right to try, Mm -hmm. which is essentially that very same argument, the very same permission that the cancer patients were asking for, and it passed state by state Mm -hmm. until a very large number of states. I think when you and I were talking earlier, you said 40, and that's probably right. Um, And then that's when uh, Trump said, I want to sign this bill, put it on my desk, because it's obvious that the states (laughs) were going to legalize what the federal government was not allowing. Another Tenth Amendment uh, coup, if you will. (laughs) Absolutely. And we see this all the time. And it's funny because the the federal government, they'll come in and act like the hero. You know, we've got the white cape. We're going to give you the right to try. Well, you know, thanks a lot, you know, after states have already done all this. And I'll I'll tell you the effectiveness of this. I'll give you a a true story out of Texas. Uh, There was a cancer doctor there. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce his name because I can't. (laughs) But uh, he was involved in clinical trials with a cancer drug. I believe it was for the same cancer that Steve Jobs died from. And uh, he had a bunch of patients in this clinical trial. And then the clinical trial ended and he tried to get permission from the FDA to continue giving the patients. And they're like, well, no, we can't do that because now we have to do the evaluation and, and you know, determine whether or not we're going to approve this. So you need to quit giving this to these patients. Well, it had been tremendously successful in treating these patients. So basically, as the doctor put it, the FDA was asking me to give these people a death sentence yes. and take them yes. off of the treatment. So at that point, Texas had passed the, uh, the right to try law. So he went ahead and continued providing the drug under the Texas law. And uh, about 70 patients were able to continue treatment that basically the federal government was just going to say, you know what, it's okay. We'll just let them die because we've got our That's right. procedures. So, yeah. Yeah. This, this stuff enrages me. <laughs> Yeah, well, it should, obviously. You know, there's no reason for those people to die. They at least have a chance with the drug. And if the drug company is willing to give it to them, why not? Right, absolutely. And, and you know, I think this is a, a, a lesson that we can even expand outside of FDA. I mean, how many things in our lives are regulated? And what is the impact of all of that on the economy and on, you know, the lives of real people? Right. Well, every federal regulator destroys about 160 private sector jobs. So every regulation really depresses the economy. And it does so oftentimes, almost always. I haven't actually, I don't have a positive example to share with you. (laughs) It, it, It actually harms people. For example, there've been studies done on the different regulations in states for electricians. And the more requirements that the state has for licensing electricians, the more accidental electrocutions it has. And this seems counterintuitive, but if you think about it for a moment, if you have a lot of red regulatory hoops that an electrician has to jump through, it's going to cost more money and time. So there's going to be fewer of them. They raise their prices because there's fewer of them and there's, you know, a demand. And what ends up happening is the people who can't afford to hire the electrician Mm. either try the repair themselves or they do without either way, you know, they're risking their lives. And, and, And the same is true for optometrists. There's more blindness in states that heavily regulate optometrists and so, you know, if you think about it, you really can have death by regulation. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, it's interesting, too. And, and something that I've experienced, I used to be in the airline industry. And, of course, that's, a, that's an industry where you have a lot of oversight and, and safety regulations as far as uh, for the workforces go. And what I found was a lot of times management was so obsessed about following the rules that actual common sense safety wasn't really considered. Sure. So people That's were doing all kinds of dangerous things, but it was okay because that wasn't against the rules. And, and then when somebody gets hurt, somebody comes, oh, well, we need to make a rule for that. And, it, and just, yeah. it, there, was, there was no common sense or thought process involved. It was all check off the list. 
Yes, yes. And, and you know, in the case of the FDA, which we were talking about earlier, because they increased the timeline from four to 14 years with the 1962 regulations, people die waiting for life-saving drugs. We yeah. talked about that a little earlier. And then, of course, because the companies have to jump through more regulatory hoops, they spend their money doing that instead of spending it on research for new drugs. So if you calculate, you know, the loss there, you conservatively come out with uh, uh, about uh, 40 million deaths, which is wow. like, you know, one out of every two people who have died since 62 have had time shaved off their lives by these. And if you kind of spread it over the whole population, another way of saying it is that each of us have lost five years of our lives to these regulations. Wow. And it's actually probably twice that because the FDA really doesn't allow food and um, supplement manufacturers to make health claims for right. their product unless they go through this 14 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that we hear about these things through the internet is it's actually very hard for the FDA to clamp down on every every manufacturer that makes a claim, but they right. do they do take some of the companies and make examples sure. of them. And, and they did that with the cherry grow, growers and walnut growers. In fact, diamond walnuts uh, was sued because the FDA sent them a warning letter saying, hey, you're making health claims for the components in your walnuts by putting scientific publications on your website. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> that, yeah, that show that, that things in your walnuts are healthful. So, uh, you know, uh, Di uh, Diamond Walnuts had to pay a huge fine uh, because of that. So it's it's really very counterproductive. And, of course, if, if people don't know about good health uh, techniques that they can use in terms of supplements or prevention or um, foods, then, you know, we're going to all be that much poorer health-wise for it. Yeah, you know, it's ironic, too, thinking back to the, the CBD um, one of the things that they said in these uh, hearings, I think they were uh, May 31st is when they had this big hearing on, on CBD. And one of the things that they kept saying is, well, there's just not enough information out there on this. Well, the information <laughs> that's out there, they don't want anybody to talk about. <laughs> you know, you, oh, get, right. you get sued if you talk about the information or, or bring up the studies that are out there. They have to be government approved. So, you know, out of one side of their mouth, they're talking about, well, people need information. And, and on the other side of the mouth, they're keeping people from getting the information that they need. Oh, yeah. Actually, it was illegal to do any studies with cannabis yeah. uh, for many, many years. So it's, you know, if we don't have information, who do we point the finger to? <laughs> right. right. Um, you know, we talked about regulation depressing the economy, and um, it, it made me think about it. So one of my pet peeves is Republicans who pretend like they're limited government. Um, because they're not. I used to think yeah. they were. I guess that's why it peeves me so much because I'm a, I'm a reformed neocon. So, <laughs> um, but you get this thing, and, and they and they want to cut taxes. And I love tax cuts as much mm -hmm. as the next guy. But Peter Schiff once said that we don't just need tax reform; we also need government reform. In other words, we've got all of this spending. I mean, trillions mm -hmm. and trillions right. of dollars of spending, and you slap tax cuts without dealing with the spending, you're just increasing that debt even more. How right. does this impact economic growth more broadly? Well, actually, the more the government spends, the slower the rate of wealth creation or the rate of GDP increase. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been a lot of studies on this. It's pretty, pretty well cast in stone, if you will. Right. And countries that have wanted to change the fact that they're very near bankruptcy and actually get their economic engine growing again know this well. You know, Great Britain, Ireland, and New Zealand all had periods in the last century where they decided they were going to lower taxes, lower tariffs, and get rid of a lot of regulation mm -hmm. because they were desperate. And lo and behold, <laughs> in, in a year or two, they basically turned around their economy and at the end of the five-year period or something that they had chosen to do this and, you know, had, had doubled the rate of wealth creation. It's amazing. Just huge. And, you know, this wasn't even, um, this wasn't even a total uh, repudiation of regulation and taxes and tariffs. This right. was partial. So, you know, depending on whose study you look at, I calculate that we could 
if we got rid of all the regulations of taxes or, you know, almost all of them, we'd either double to maybe even as much as 20 times the rate of wealth creation that we have now. That would allow us to pay off our debt basically painlessly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you think about it, if you try to conceive, what would you do if you had twice as much wealth as you had today or twice mm -hmm. as much money in your paycheck? I mean, it, it's almost hard to think about. Because it would right. really change how you lived, right? So this is this is a big deal. This is a big deal, and that's the lower end of the estimate. So yeah. we really need to think about that. I tell you what made me really aware of it is when I became self-employed and started having to write those uh, checks to the IRS, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you start thinking, man, how much uh, how how much would I be able to do if I could keep this five thousand dollars that I'm sending off to Uncle Sam to fund some stupid war that I don't want to be in. <laughs> Yes, yes. Of course, the war is, it, it's, um, I, I used to use the analogy, it's like burning money, but it's actually worse than that, because at least if you burned money, you'd have a little bit of, you'd have something to offset inflation. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. And we could get the Fed out of the picture, too, and then we could really, really That's be right. running and gunning. That's um, right. That's right. So you mentioned tariffs. What are your thoughts on the uh, on the trade war? You know, if you raise tariffs, if we raise tariffs on our um, on, on other people's products, what that means is our citizenry can't buy them at a good price. <laughs> In other words, we're increasing prices for our citizens. Yes. Well, this I, is crazy. I say this every time I, I do a podcast called The Friday Gold Wrap for Shift Gold every Friday. And I think almost every episode, I know every episode that I've mentioned tariffs, I've pointed out the fact that a tariff is a tax. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, there's the old mantra, you can't tax yourself into prosperity. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, if people, you know, people think um, the tariffs help protect jobs, but the jobs they help protect are the inefficient ones. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that hurts us. Plus, like I said, in addition to paying somebody more than they should be getting, we are basically raising prices for ourselves. It's nuts. Yeah. I guess the, the counter argument that you'll get is that this is a strategy and that these tariffs aren't going to last forever and we're going to get a <laughs> we're going to get a great big trade deal. Yeah, we still have the sugar tariffs, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So so instead of instead of having sugar in our candy and other products, we have the high fructose corn syrup, which is actually a lot less healthy than right. sugar. Although sugar is not necessarily a good thing either. Don't get me wrong. I'm right. not recommending sugar. But compared to high fructose corn syrup, it's 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 an improvement. <laughs> well, it's it's been great for the corn industry though. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> which which again, you know, it, when you when you start getting into these policies and and uh, you know, people talk about the the big most people don't really talk about the the micro ac economic aspects of it and what's really going on in the nuts and bolts and people don't realize that you know these things are being used by special interest groups to favor one group over another and manipulate your decisions and uh you know you just the sugar is a perfect example because it's uh, um it's protects american sugar interests but it raises prices the corn people like it because they sell more corn Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, it's you and I who are, are suffering from these policies, right. but we don't know it. And that's why people don't get mad about it. You know, they hear, well, Trump's going to get us a great trade deal. So this is not, you know, how much money was yes. it that they're sending to the farmer, the soybean farmers, like $14 billion or something absurd like that to offset the tariffs, which mm -hmm. comes out of your out of your uh, tax dollar? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. You know, I think people don't they don't want to. It's hard for them to admit that the government might not be their friend. They yeah. want to think of the government as a protective parent almost. But, you know, it's just like abused children. They do not want to believe that their parents don't love them when they beat them up. Right. You know, they want to believe, oh, yes, their love. Something must be wrong with me, the child says, because it's easier to believe that than that the parent doesn't love them. And I think it's the same with the American citizenry. They want to believe that their government protects them. They don't realize that the reason Americans had good government for so long was because the government was too small to do much damage. Yeah. And so now that the government is big and is doing a lot of damage, they don't realize that we've lost the very thing that made our government great, which 
that it was so small it couldn't hurt us. <laughs> yeah, they say that if you go back to the to the early to mid 1800s, most Americans the only exposure they would have ever had to anybody in the federal government was the post office. Ah, that's probably true. Yes, that's I mean, probably you would have true. never and and think about it today. I mean, the the federal government dictates how much water is in your toilet and what kind of light bulbs you can have. That's I mean, right. it's involved in the in the intimacy of our lives and um you know, I I feel it personally with the CBD. It's a personal issue for me because I use it, uh, and, mm-hmm. and it's been very helpful to me. And, uh, and and then, you know, on a sad note, I I have a friend and, and a uh, activist who's been involved in marijuana activism for years and years. That just got indicted on federal uh, drug charges. He could have ten to tw- ten years to life in prison uh, oh. for allegedly uh, moving marijuana across state lines. Oh. So I don't. You know, whether he's guilty or not, I think that, that putting somebody in a cage for the rest of their lives for a plant uh, when people get That's away ridiculous. with murder, yeah, yeah. It's, it's absurd. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I've got one more question for you. This is a fun sure. one. This is, this is, it's fun, but it's important because this will determine whether or not I ever let you be on the show again. <laughs> no pressure, huh? <laughs> no pressure. So, and it's, it's kind of split. It's more split than I thought it would be. When you are typing on a computer... Do you put two spaces at the end of a sentence? I used to, but not anymore. <laughs> you get to be on the show. Yay. <laughs> uh, this, this is one of my pet peeves as an editor. I get I get people who uh, send me these documents and they have all these spaces. And um, it looks good on a typewriter, but when you put it in a computer, it's awful. And thank goodness you have on, on Word, you have the find and replace. I can just, you know. Yes, yes, yes. I have to admit, it's a hard, it's a hard uh, habit to break. <laughs> did, did you take typing in school? Yes, I did. Yeah, see, that's most people who do that. They they had that ingrained into their heads through mm-hmm. through typing. But of course, kids today they don't take typing. I don't know that that's even a thing to teach in school. Um, yeah, I don't know either. They they do the thing the phone with their thumbs and I haven't kind of gotten there yet. <laughs> my my them. kids make fun of me because I I actually text with my finger. That's what I do too. Yeah. Or I use actually, I usually dictate it. That's well, that's yeah. There, there's that too. But yeah, I I get made fun of a lot by my by my kids who are not really even kids anymore. They're college age now. But <laughs> yeah. dad's old. So well, I really do appreciate you taking the time. I've I've enjoyed the talk. I think we've covered some some good topics. Uh, before we go, I want you to just uh, give us any information as far as links. Uh, websites, anything that you want to leave with the audience where they can find all things about you? So my website, ruart.com, is the best source, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. Earlier, we talked about Liberty International, uh, so I want to give you that. It's liberty-intl.org, or you can use our old acronym, isil.org. It will still take you to our site. And You know, in both sites, there's a lot of free material. Uh, There's excerpts from my book on Ruart.com. There's blogs. The free library has videos and things of that nature. And the same is true for Liberty International. When we have our conferences, we tape our talks. If you hit the YouTube channel link, you can go to those and enjoy them. Even though you miss the conference, (laughs) you can at least hear the talks. Do Do you do the Twitter? Um, I do do some Twitter. Yes, not a whole lot. All right. Well, I'll put your Twitter on on the uh, on the show notes page too. I'm I'm not a good Twitter. Tom Woods is like the master Twitterer. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes, actually, if you go to my website, there's links to the Facebook page and YouTube channel and all that, so you can get all that there. Cool. Well, again, I appreciate it. Appreciate every, everything that you're doing and and your uh, tireless work for liberty, and appreciate you sharing a little bit of your knowledge with us. And I hope you have well, a great day. Well, I've had a great time on the show, and I hope you and your listeners. Have a wonderful day as well. You've been watching It's Your Dime, an interview series presented by Shift Gold. For more information on investing in gold and silver, talk to a Shift Gold precious metal specialist today at 1-888-GOLD-160. That's 1-888-465-3160. Or visit us on the web at shiftgold.com. You can keep up with all of the latest precious metals news at shiftgold.com news and tune in each week to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap podcast. 
This is your host, Mike Meharry. I appreciate you watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.